me once more before we dive into the text Devin just read. Heavenly Father, we ask that you are gracious to us this morning, um, gracious to give us ears to hear what your word has to say for us. We ask that, uh, that not only is this an exercise in listening, um, but that this too is an act of faith whereby we submit ourselves to your holy word and the work of the Holy Spirit to bear in us uh, conviction, repentance, obedience, and worship. And we pray all of this in your name. Amen. Uh, William Shakespeare once penned, be not afraid of greatness. Some are born great, some achieve greatness, and others have greatness thrust upon them. But if you're listening to the words that Devin just read for us this morning, Jesus' words from Luke chapter 22, his tone toward greatness is maybe a little more pessimistic than Bill's was. He at least says that we ought to perhaps be fearful of greatness, at least the idea of worldly greatness, greatness according to the king's Of this world. And the Bible presents that our thoughts and our quests for static status and greatness have themselves a great problem. You see, it was a perverse desire for greatness that the Bible tells us is what caused Adam and Eve to raise their hands and to take the fruit in a cosmic rebellion against God. They wanted to be great like God. And the truth is, is none of us think we can be like God without simultaneously thinking that we are greater than God. To think that we can hold some sort of equality with the God who describes himself in this way in Scripture is to actually elevate ourselves beyond him, to think that we know better than him, to go past where God has created us and to take what is his and his alone. And more than just being like the opening pages of the Bible, this actually explains the whole of our reality for anyone who wonders what it's like to be successful, to be great, to have power, to find status and belonging. You see, from that moment on, the world became a marketplace, a marketplace competing for greatness. We are a marketplace trying to edge out each other, steal from one another, work our way to the tops of our classes, our depth charts, our corporate structures, or our family life. And I'm sure you felt the weight of that too. Maybe you've seen the way others look at you when you're succeeding. Or maybe you know the way you look at others when they're succeeding. Maybe you've seen people who you begin to resent in your heart because they now have some sort of tool or some sort of sign that brings a vindication and a validation to them that you wish you had. Maybe they have the house you want or the family you want, got the promotion you want. Or maybe you're finding yourself increasingly annoyed at that lady at work who works in the same department as you, you're working on the same projects, and yet for some reason she seems to be the one who's getting all the praise from the manager or the boss or the client. You see, from a secular worldview, it's this sort of competition that led men like Karl Marx to want to renovate this by changing up the entirety of the economic structure. But the Bible says if we want to know true greatness which is not merely an intellectual exercise. That's to say, if we actually want to know where our status, our position, our belonging, and our success is, if we want to be freed from the disappointment of that rat race, we don't need a new economy. We need a new heart. The Bible reminds us this in James chapter 4, where he says this. He says, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have... So you murder, you covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. Our hearts are at war over who is the greatest, and it is a cutthroat competition to that end. We want to be great, we want the symbol of greatness, we want to be treated as one who is great, but as Adam's sin brought confusion into our quest for status, Jesus Christ, as the second Adam, brings clarity to all of this. This has been what Luke has been showing us in his gospel giving us the life of Jesus Christ. And at this moment in Luke 22, we're at the Last Supper. And here, Jesus is preparing his disciples for life after his death. And today, he's correcting their understandings of themselves and their understandings of others by reframing power, authority, and privilege in light of true greatness. Those words might be buzzwords in our culture today. Power, authority, privilege, And that's why we should listen to what the Bible has for us today. And this is our main point this morning in Luke 22. Our main point is simple, that true greatness is hidden in Christ and in his church. 
True greatness is hidden in Christ and in his church. And I use that term hidden because earlier on in the book of Luke, some Pharisees came to Jesus and they say, when will we see the kingdom of God in power? And Jesus says, that kingdom is coming in a way you cannot see it. And he says, even if it were to come today, you would not see it. Why? Because the kingdom had come in power before them in Jesus Christ. And they couldn't see it. Sinful eyes cannot see the true realities of the kingdom or the true realities of greatness. But today, Jesus is going to help us see. He's going to help us see what our sinful eyes in this confused world conceal. And so we're going to see this in four ways. First, we're going to see the problem of greatness. Then we're going to see the posture of greatness, the person of greatness, and lastly, the people of greatness. So that should be on the screens, and uh, don't feel like you have to write that down the whole time, but those are the four ways we're going to look at this text. And so first, we're going to examine the problem of greatness. When I started dating my wife, uh, her friends and her family quickly came to me to reveal a, a unique idiosyncrasy about my wife. They said, it is impossible to take a bad picture of her. Being a good boyfriend, I wanted to test this theory. And so uh, in the advent of camera phones, I made it my job to try and snap some unflattering picture of my wife, and I quickly found that they were true. You couldn't really do it. Last night, my wife's gone. We're video chatting with my kids, and it froze. And you know how when cameras freeze on us, we're always like, like that? <laughs> my wife was like, I'd still date that. Like, that's, she's beautiful. <laughs> and, and, and so what's interesting here is, like, her friends and her family said this as a quip with kind of frustration, right? Because beauty like that doesn't come natural when it comes to pictures. What comes natural is accidentally opening your phone and seeing how many chins you have, or blinks and sneezes, or mid-cough contortions, or awkward photo bombers. That's what's natural. And so too, what Jesus is telling us today is that there is a natural greatness in our world. But like those pictures that catch us uh, by surprise, it is not a flattering greatness. In fact, it is not greatness at all. The problem of greatness, according to the world standards, is that natural greatness is nasty greatness. Notice Luke's context and Jesus' response here, how it's pulling out the falsity of what they're looking for in the world. Verse 24 and 25, Luke begins saying this, a dispute arose among them. And so this is the disciples at table with Jesus. As to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. And he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors. So what's going on here? Well, to, to reach back into our recesses of our childhood, do you remember that time when your parents were leaving, and maybe you have siblings or friends in the home with you, and knowing they're going to leave, the discussion quickly turns to what? Who's in charge? Who's the one who gets to make the shots, who has the authority? And in essence, this is what's happening at the Last Supper. Jesus has predicted he's going to die. Immediately before this, he mentions he's going to be betrayed. And the conversation naturally drifts to who's going to get to be in charge when Jesus is no longer there. Who's going to fill Jesus' shoes? And here we see how conflicted and confused our own hearts are. The Bible talks about our hearts as being simultaneously sufferers and simultaneously sinners. And so we see how natural it is to grieve in tenderness the passing of Jesus, which is what the disciples were doing. They were grieving, they were sorrowful, they were sad. But we also see the downside of the natural human heart. As easy as it is to grieve in tenderness, it is easy to be greedy in selfishness. They immediately begin to see how this opportunity might benefit them. And Jesus leans into these hearts by showing them how they ought to think about it differently. He's saying, you're thinking about this whole thing from the wrong direction. You see, it's not long ago that Jesus spoke into the disciples' anxiety, a certain anxiety that is probably mounting as the intensifications of Jesus' death are drawing nearer. But in Luke 12, he says this. He says, do not worry about anything for the nations. And so actually, it's relevant because that word nations is the same word used in Luke 22 when Jesus says the Gentile kings. And so nations is ethnos. It's the same as Gentile kings. And so uh, for the nations, the Gentiles of this world seek after these things. Instead, seek the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added to you. So Jesus says, take it easy. If you're seeking the kingdom of God then you don't need to worry about anything. 
Seek the kingdom of God and everything will fall into place. All these things will be added to you. And yet, how do the, do the disciples begin to process life in light of their anxiety in this moment? Not according to the kingdom of God, but according to the kings of the Gentiles. They're perceiving greatness and how they're to live in light of worldly kings. And so first, we should be mindful that we too are all too prone to drifting into worldly thinking about spiritual needs. Whether it's in regards to our sexuality, our finances, our physical or mental health, or our family, it is all true natural to drift into worldly wisdom. We encounter problems as Christians. We encounter problems as citizens of the kingdom of God, but we seek solutions from the gods of this world, from the kings of the Gentiles. And this world can be very helpful in identifying what's wrong, in pointing out problems and inconsistencies. But the world cannot rightly interpret what we find because the world is not the creator. The creator of the world is. And in the book of Jeremiah, God warns his people of following prophets who speak to God's people but whose primary interpretation is not God or his word, but is ourselves, our emotions, and our world. Jeremiah warns of this, saying this in verse 20, or chapter 23. Thus says the Lord of hosts, do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you, filling you with vain hopes. They speak visions of their own minds, not from the mouth of the Lord. They say continually to those who despise the word of the Lord, it shall be well with you. And to everyone who stubbornly follows his own heart, they say, no disaster shall come upon you. When we view our world through a strictly human and strictly emotional lens, we can identify problems, but our problem solving can only go so far. And that's because we can slap solutions and we could deal with externals but we can never actually understand the true reality of what's at play in our hearts. That's what leads to, to silly ideas like Marxism, to equalize the economy. And now, look, everyone loves everyone, but it didn't address the heart, and therefore the problem remains. Aha, capitalism. We'll incentivize it that way. That solved all the problems. But it doesn't because it can't address the heart. To adequately see any of our problems, we need to see our own heart. And to see our own heart, we need to see the heart of God who made us. And Jesus Christ has come to reveal the heart of God towards those whose hearts are broken. In the person of Jesus and in God's word, he shows all of this to us. And now God begins to interpret it to us like a good parent does. I see you see this problem, but can I help you think about it from a different perspective? If we want to better understand our needs and our issues, we need Jesus' help. And the Bible is what helps us make sense of our reality. And so Jesus now begins to deconstruct their understanding of greatness. And he shows how worldly greatness, the greatness they're thinking of, the paradigms they're viewing life through, is a sham. It has no substance. And so in essence, he's beginning to show them that if you would just look at this, even with your own human eyes, you'd realize that this is not truly great. He said the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship and rule over people with their authority so that they could be called benefactors. And the title benefactor was a big deal in that day and age. It was a title that was kind of given to the social elite. It was taken from two Greek words, one that means good and one that means works. And so it's the one who does good works. To be dubbed a good worker, a benefactor, was to be given a title like social media influencers today, politicians. It was associated with wealth and honor. Economically, many cities were dependent upon their benefactor relationships. But Jesus is exposing what even secular historians have found to be true in this benefactor-client relationship. These relationships were entirely one-sided. While these individuals were called benefactors, it was a title in name only. There was no good and there was no good works. The way Jesus puts it is that these people are not doing good, but instead they're using their authority, their power, and their position as a weapon to be called good. And isn't this often how we encounter it in, with schoolyard bullies or modern mean girls in our cafeteria? It's the people who have the power to hurt or the power to bless who leverage those things and threaten to withhold unless we pander to them. 
They weaponize these things. And so you give the bully what he wants so that you don't get punched. He's catered to. He's spoken well of, at least to his face. You tell the mean girl she looks pretty or that she has the best notebook, and you do that so that you get invited to her fancy birthday parties or you don't end up on her hit list being slandered behind closed doors. In other words, these benefactors, the good was in their name, but it was not in their nature. They were praised in the public square only because they lorded their possession and their power over others as a tool not to serve good works, but to be served. They seemed to be generous and kind, but it was only to the extent that they extorted servitude and honor from the masses. Worldly greatness is often empty greatness. In fact, the Greek of this clause, depending on your Bible translation, it says that they labor, that they might be called themselves benefactors. They don't care what they are. They just care. They, want, they say, hey, you, call me a benefactor, and I'm going to threaten you until you do. They even know. It's not a true title. And we often know that too when it comes to categories of worldly greatness. But isn't it odd that we still want it? We still want those titles. We still want to be spoken of in those ways. And notice how Luke says the disciples were arguing, listen to his words about who would be regarded, or that is to say, who would be considered, who would be seen as the greatest, who would be called the greatness. It was merely an issue of superficial titles that they were dickering over. And the truth is we are all too often content to live for such a name, even if it's an empty one, because we know it is an empty one. We often want to be called good as a comfort to those who know we are not, in fact, good. We think and we hope that if enough people say, this guy's good, this girl gets it, that we might say, maybe I do. Maybe I do get it. Maybe I am finally good. You see, remember the context of this is right after Jesus tells his disciples, one of them is going to betray him. And look at what follows immediately. Verses 23 and 24, where we ended last week, where we begin this week. And they began to question one another, which of them it could be who was going to do this. And a dispute arose among them as to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. So did you notice what happened? Their boasting in their greatness was a mechanism against their potential sin. The conversation began, is it you? Are you the one who's going to betray Jesus? To the defense mechanism of, can't be me, I'm the greatest. I would never do that. I'm too good for that to be true of me. You see, much of our desire by worldly standards to be perceived as smart, successful, fit, fabulous, it stems from a problem that only Jesus can fix. We hope that a new name might atone for our failings, might atone for what we know to be true in our hearts, might atone for what we think is lacking. But there's only one name that can do that, and it's Jesus' name, and it's not yours. The title of greatness given to you by the world, on your name placard, on your social media bio, told to you by your kids or by your beloved, does nothing to actually bring peace to the not great realities of our soul. But faith in Jesus' name alone removes that paranoia because it's rooted not in a false reality, but in a true one. You are given the name righteous because of Jesus' true righteousness. It is not empty, it is not false, it is full because he and he alone lived a sinless, perfect life. He and he alone is great par excellence. And when we take his name by faith, it puts an end to all of our desires to fight, claw, and steal to be titled by something from the world. Real greatness is not self-titled. Real greatness is not a name given to us by others. Real greatness is from Jesus and Jesus alone. And that's why Jesus is assuming here that it's only those that see the title of saint as more spectacular than any worldly position who can accurately understand true greatness. That's what he says as he transitions here. He says, but not so with you. Those who see Me, those who are my disciples, do not think this way. Instead, he goes on to say in verse 26, rather let the greatest among you become as the youngest and the leader as the one who serves. 
And so this is our second point this morning, the posture of greatness. More than having greatness in a name, here are those whose greatness is of their nature, and that posture is the nature of service. The world uh, attaches greatness to a name at the end. They do anything and only to be called a name. But Jesus attaches greatness to a nature. In other words, greatness in whatever title you get, in whatever ecosystem that titles you, is not the end of your quest. It is actually the beginning of it. The one who is the greatest is the leader. And they are called to exercise that authority by doing what? By continuing in ongoing humble service to others. Now, our world today has a wonderful category for service. We like humble service. It's often seen as great. But I heard one pastor say once that we often like to be seen as a servant when it's advantageous to us, right? When someone speaks at your eulogy, we'd like to be called humble. We'd like to be called a servant. But how do you feel when someone treats you like a servant when you don't want to be? When someone asks something of you, when you think that should be asked of someone else, that's a completely different scenario. When it's not socially advantageous, it's actually costly to be treated as a servant. And Jesus is here showing that this kind of greatness is not a naturally reoccurring element in our world. And that's why he uses that verb, become. You must become as the younger. You must become as the one who serves. We have to work at it. We have to become that. But actually, this becoming is not merely a human-powered work. It's something that must happen by the mercy of Jesus himself. We can't give up our desire for prestige until Jesus makes us something else by faith because none of us can become younger. Look at how much money marketing puts into you looking younger, feeling younger, being younger. That's a great business strategy because no one will exhaust it. They will buy, 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 and none of you will become younger. It is unnatural. And that's why we need Jesus' mercy, to do what we cannot. Remember the shock in John chapter 3, where Nicodemus approaches Jesus, and Jesus says, in order um, to be saved, you must be born again. For us today, sitting thousands of years removed, born again often just stands for political party. Maybe it's just Christian vernacular that we just use, slang. But to think about being born again in a serious context would cause you to respond in the same way Nicodemus did in John 3, 4, when he says this, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? No. Kids, none of you in here can be born again by your mom. It has to happen a different way. But if we marvel at how unnatural Christian conversion is, then we must also marvel at how unnatural Christian greatness is. For we cannot naturally become as the younger. We drift towards childlike immaturity, not towards childlike humility, right? If we're being passive, we're not drifting towards the good things of being younger. We're drifting towards the bad things of being younger. We want to be seen as sweet like a child, as tender like a child, but we want all of that perception while we have all of the privileges of being an adult. But it's precisely these privileges that Jesus is attacking here when he's turning greatness on his head. He's saying that those who are truly great lay down their privileges in service of others. The person who is in authority uses their authority to serve with their authority. And it's important to note in our world today that Jesus is not undoing authority. He's not getting rid of authority. He's not getting rid of leadership. He's not getting rid of power. He's not anti-authority. Instead, he's showing us the new nature of authority, the original nature of authority that is found in him and then applied in the lives of his disciples. Those who are born again by faith are born again to take up positions which the world sees as lowly, as belonging to children, and as a class of servants. But this is why our world has gotten so bonkers and off the rails in regards to authority and abuse and power. We fight, we scratch, we cheat, we claw, and abuse our way to the top of the power scale. Why? Why do you think we do that? Why is Netflix never going to be at the end of documentaries of people abusing their way to the top? Why is it so attractive? Because we've lost 
what true authority is. We think that if we can get to the position of authority, then we finally have gotten to the place where we are served, where we can rest, where people give us what we want, where there by our own power we experience relief and all of our needs satisfied. But how different and how refreshing is God's created reality of authority. We do not pursue positions of power and greatness so that we are served, but that we might subject all of our power and all of the benefits of authority into the service of both God and others. That's what authority does. It exists to work with all of the power and all of the honor for the service of God and others. And authority exists in far more places than we think. To the Christian mom, to the Christian boss, to the Christian manager, the Christian husband, pastor, preschool teacher, your position of authority doesn't symbolize the end of your service, but instead the beginning of it. It is the posture from which we begin to serve anew, where all of the benefits are not bent toward us, but bent toward others. I've recently been convicted of this when sitting and watching football or sitting on the couch. My child will be sitting next to me. We're in the exact same position, but I'll go ahead and ask them to get me something or do something that I am fully capable of doing. We've all done that. Or maybe as a kid, you wish for that. But why? Why do I assume that my child, who is sitting there doing the exact same thing as me, is more worthy, in a sense, more beheld to getting up and serving me than I am to go and do it for myself? The truth is, is because I'm thinking that my position as dad has earned me a special right to be served. They're my children, aren't they? Ought they not to serve me like this? And this shows up everywhere. And to change our minds on this, we need to change our hearts. And Paul talks about this in Romans 12.3. He says this, and I want you to pay attention to where he's centering all of this change. Romans 12.3, he says, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly than he ought to think, but with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. And so notice where Paul starts this examination process. He doesn't say, think about the nature of service. Study it, write a thesis on it, get some books on it. He doesn't say, really find the true reality of yourself. Go get a self-help book. Go stare in the mirror. He doesn't even say, start with others. Go look at the needs of your community. Where does he start it? Each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. How we view ourselves and how we treat others is connected and derivative of the faith that we have and what that reveals about how we view and how we treat God. We can only begin to see and act clearly when the binoculars of our faith fill the whole of our world with the greatness of God. Then we understand greatness. A right view of God is the beginning of gospel greatness, and we can spend an eternity trying to humble ourselves, or we can look at God and be humbled. We can spend an eternity trying to see what true service looks like, or we can look at Jesus Christ, the God who became flesh to serve us. And this is exactly where Jesus goes as he turns another cultural example on his head in verse 27, where he says this, and now he begins to tie authority to himself, and greatness to himself. For who is greater, the one who reclines at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at the table? But I am among you as the one who serves. You see, the center of Christian greatness, the center of Christian leadership, the center of Christian service is Jesus himself. And this is our third point this morning. This is the person of greatness. The person of greatness is Jesus himself. And if you just look at the world, it's hard to see how any of this actually makes sense in any sort of practical way. 
And that's why Jesus, he's actually drawing this out <clears throat> as he begins to talk about this analogy of the table, this deeply rooted um, cultural moment. So the one who reclines at the table, they didn't have chairs back then. They all had really good low backs. And so they all just laid and like rec reclined on each other. And so when he's talking about reclining and serving, he's talking about a paradigm that we roughly still have today. That the one who sits at the table and is feasting is of greater nobility, worth, value, power, authority, greatness than the one who serves, than the waitress, than the waiter, than the servant. But then he says this. He says, is that not common? Is the greater one not the one who reclines? But am I not among you as the one who serves? The whole of the Christian worldview only makes sense when Jesus and Jesus alone is at the center. All the commands of obedience, all the commands of worship, all the other obligations it gives makes no footing, or has no sense apart from Jesus at the center of it. No one is greater than Jesus. He's the king of the whole universe. And yet what has he come to do? To serve. He came to submit his will to the will of the Father and to submit his service to those whose very sins would put him to death on a cross just a few hours after this. Gospel leadership and greatness only make sense in Jesus because it shows that all of our acts of greatness and leadership are acts of faith. It does not make sense by worldly eyes. It only makes sense when we have faith in Jesus. And we see how Jesus submitted himself to this, not only as a model, but as a redeemer, as the one who did perfectly what we could never do. And we might protest Look at this. You know, we live in a busy world. We're going to say, this is great. This is some of Jesus' wonderful, like, book of fables things, like, service is good. We should learn to serve. But in all reality, it's like we got deadlines to meet. We got these kids in line. I've got to run a business. Certainly, we have to find a different way to live is great. We have to find a different way to be successful. And this is why we have to look to Jesus, because when we see how Jesus lived, it shows that the whole world is living in black and white, but the gospel gives us color. It gives us the depth. It makes 3D what otherwise is flat. Look at Jesus' service. Jesus served by teaching. Jesus served by rebuking. Jesus served by counseling. Jesus served by saying, follow me. Service did not mean that hard things were not said or done. Service was not apathy, nor was it anarchy. But Jesus' service was submission to the plan and purpose of God, and in that we are saved, and in that the church is being built. That is to say, there is nothing more than service can accomplish. There is no more helpful tool than Christian service. You see, because Jesus was submitted first to the Father, we, we invert this. And we say, well, if I'm going to be a servant, I'm just going to serve whatever your waking needs are. I'm going to subject myself to everyone. And that's good, and that's kind, and you'll have a wonderful eulogy. But if we want to be really effective with our service, we submit ourselves first to God and to his plan, and then our service of others is tied to something that cannot fail. It is the most effective means of getting done what is of ultimate importance. Our service of others when baptized in submission to the plan of God to seek and save the lost is never static service. It's never circular service. It's never enabling service. It is always progressive service to the end that God has appointed. This is how God's new people are to lead great lives. So if we want to trust that our service is in submission to the plan and purpose of God, then we need to trust that we will not fail by doing what Christ has called us to do. We submit ourselves to God through Jesus Christ and we live in light of his purpose and of his commands. And in this, we get a new community, a community of greatness. And this is where Jesus closes in verses 28 through 30. <clears throat> you are those who have stayed with me in my trials. And I assign to you, as my father assigned to me, a kingdom that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So do you see the subtle transition Jesus makes here? He goes from Gentile kings to gospel kings, from worldly kingdoms to God's kingdom. And this is our final point this morning. This is where we see the people of greatness. 
If Jesus is the person of greatness, then the church is the people of greatness who follow in his footsteps. Why is service, why is humility the way to greatness? Well, because quite frankly, it is the only way to the only real kingdom. It is the only thing with any merit or substance. The Titanic was billed as the unsinkable ship. Spoiler alert, it wasn't. The world will sell you greatness on every corner and every click, but guess what? It's going to sink. The kingdom of this world is passing away, but the one who does the will of the Lord lives forever. There is one greatness that lives forever, and that is kingdom greatness. And here's a beautiful thing about our Savior. Despite how thick-headed and absolutely dumb the disciples are in this moment, uh, like read the room much, um, despite what's going on, Jesus is optimistically giving to them apostolic roles in the new kingdom. You see, from a covenant storyline in scripture, what's happening here is twofold. Jesus is here establishing the New Testament church as a fulfillment of the Old Testament promises of God. This is where the line of God's story has always been going. That it was uh, the 12 tribes that is now seen as coupled with the 12 apostles. It was once a physical people, and now it's going to be a spiritual people. In Revelation 21, the new city of God comes down, and John tells us this. It says, it has 12 foundations, and on that city were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And so there's a new authority here that God is giving to the apostles, and that will be representative even in glory. And even though these disciples were called to serve, they were promised that one day they will sit and eat at the table of God. One day service takes a break. At that, di- that table they could rest. At that table they'd be honored properly. And so that's one. That's this future-oriented Uh, glory-based angle that Jesus is talking about. But there's a secondary one here. On a more immediate level, Jesus is commissioning the unique role of the apostles to establish the church in the New Testament. He's giving to them a kingdom. In the book of Matthew, Jesus says to his disciples in Matthew 16 that to the church are given the keys of the kingdom. And it was these apostles who Jesus entrusted to establish that authority here on earth, even though it is not the full kingdom of God and will not be, until Christ has renewed all things. And so there's this lens here of the church in glory, but also this lens of the church in progress, that we are to see what the apostles are doing, we're to submit to them, and they are to submit to Christ's pattern of serving as well. But in seeing how Jesus speaks to the men who would oversee the startup of the church, we can see a few things about the nature of the church and those of us in here today who are part of that. And so first, I want you to notice how Jesus speaks of the disciples here. When speaking in the context of greatness, what does he call them? What are they to do? Well, in verse 28, he calls them the stayers. You're those who have stayed with me in my trials. In verse 26, they're called the servers. Though kingdom greatness awaits, it's not about anything special about these apostles, is it? What are they doing? They're staying with Jesus, and they're serving Jesus, and they're serving as Jesus served. Their greatness is not about them. Their greatness is about the one who they serve and the one who they are with. They stayed with Jesus and they will serve like Jesus. Jesus is saying, so far you've been a stayer. So far I've taken the lead. But as I go, you're now going to be the servants. We'll talk more about this next week. You're going to be the ones who are submitting yourselves to other people. True greatness is not leaving Jesus and running to the comforts of the world. True greatness is not in serving our own best interests. True greatness stays with Jesus, even when it brings us into trials. And true greatness serves Jesus in the midst of those trials by loving others. As we stay with Jesus, we serve like Jesus. This is why the church must be a community of stayers and of servers. The world will look look at us as foolish. They'll think we're wasting our lives that we're throwing away our pleasures, that there's so much more that can be done with the however many hours a week we spend coming to church on Sunday, reading the Bible with our neighbors, sharing the gospel with our coworkers. Man, we could do so much more. We could build such a great kingdom here on earth. But as the community of the one true kingdom, we remind each other that this is the way of Christ. This is the way of glory. We, as a church, reveal the greatness that the world conceals. We do not treat each other's foolish when the priorities of the kingdom become the priorities of our lives. And we can begin to apply this posture even here in our gathering. When you come to church, 
do you see yourself as primarily being served by the worship and the word? Or do you see that you are part of that service as well? That you're serving others even by modeling what it looks like to worship God, to listen to his word, to be thoughtful in prayer. We serve others by going out of our comfort zone, by meeting them after church, by asking them about their history with the gospel or with church, seeing how we might pray for them. We serve by volunteering to care for kids, even when our weeks are filled with kids, or even when we have no idea what it looks like to care for a kid. We stay with Jesus and we serve like Jesus because Jesus did all of that for us. And no one was happier than Jesus. No one accomplished more than Jesus. And as we walk in his footsteps, we enjoy what he has done. But secondly, we see the reward of heaven. And this is important because in looking at this, it might seem like endless service. And in this life, it is. There are many times where I I come here and I work um, just one day a week. That's all pastors do. I work on that Sunday. I go home and I park in the, in the, the garage. That's where we park. And, uh, Everything in me is tired and weary, and I want to go in, and I want to sit on the couch, and I want to be served. And you know what I have to do? On those days, I, have, I, I told my wife, I was like, don't send the kids out yet. Like, just give me a second. <laughs> like, I'm weak in my flesh. Give me a second. And I pray. Second shift starts now. This is where dad serves in a different way. This is actually where dad serves in the primary way is by caring for his family here. There are very few breaks here on earth from service, but I promise you there's more breaks in your service than there was for Jesus' service in the incarnation. (laughs) And he has filled us with his Holy Spirit to do good works, and he has called us to serve. But one day, one day we rest in heaven. And here Jesus says that there's gonna be a table, and he says to the apostles, you're gonna get to judge the 12 tribes. What does he mean by that? You could ask one of the other elders. Uh, In a general sense, the Bible talks, it says that that, that we as saints will get to judge angels. Don't know what it means, but it sounds like it'll be a good time. And whatever Jesus is talking about here um, with these apostles, it's tied to some specific apostolic function that they play um, in correlation to the 12 tribes of Israel. uh, it's, It's functioning as this authority of the church, this affirmation of God's plan. But what we see here in this text are two things. We see both a table and we see thrones. At that table, we finally get to sit. At that table, the work is finally done. We get to rest. The whole of the life actually is Christian service, but in glory, even our service is restful. When Isaiah talks and says that we will run and not grow weary, he's not talking about, you know, sitting back and watching football. We will worship God and we will never tire of it. It will be the thing that gives us beautiful energy for all eternity. We will enjoy God perfectly by serving him at his table and enjoying his mercy. There's a table yet for you. But you might notice that we don't get a throne. The apostles do. So where are we in this text? Well, look at how Jesus speaks prophetically to the church of Laodicea in Revelation 3. He says this, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into, I will come into him and eat with him, and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Church, do you hear the promise of greatness? There is a greater place for you to put your status. There is a greater throne for you to sit upon than anything the world can give. And though these apostles get singled out for their own thrones, you don't have one because we get to sit with Jesus. Brothers and sisters, that's the throne you want. That's the greatness we were made for. That's where we are finally and fully satisfied, not because of our status, but because of his. We were made not to be Jesus, not to compete with his greatness, but to be with Jesus. So while we serve here, we might be discomforted, we might feel stressed, we might feel tired, we might feel burdened and weary, but one day we will sit and nothing in this world will bring you the peace that can only come 
there. Nothing in this world can give you a title other than that chair will give us. So sit with Jesus. Sit with him today by coming in faith. Serve him faithfully as a member of his church. And then one day know there is a table for you. And blessed is the one who has that privilege. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that you, um, through your Holy Spirit, that you reveal to us things that seem entirely nonsensical, things that seem like sweet fables and great goals but are impractical by worldly standards. But show us there is nothing more practical than seeing this world through the eyes of kingdom realities. And so, Lord, because you have served us, let us first come and realize that there is nothing we can do to save ourselves, but we must accept the service of another. And in so doing, Lord, humble us so that we might have a right view of you, a right view of others, and a right view of ourselves. Free us from worldly idols by showing the greatness that you have. Free us from worldly rest by showing us the beautiful rest of service. And free us from worldly uh, prestige by showing us how we might use all of our power and position, not for the selfishness of uh, our own hearts, but for the salvation of the lost and the glory of God. We pray this in your name. Amen.